Brad for inviting me and uh, AIP for also allowing me to present today. Um, Suzanne, I will have a trifecta. I am a member of RACI and AIP and I will be a member of the Royal Society of New South Wales tonight. Sorry about that, I'm one of those two. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a little giggle when Fred introduced me because uh, I am a physicist, I'm at the, in the physics discipline, but my research has some biology in it. So um, I'm not an expert though, so I have experts in my collaborative space. Um, so the title here, Don't Hold Your Breath, um, please don't. Um, I'm looking at making a disease breathalyzer, one for lung cancer, and more recently one for viral detection, but that's in its infancy, so I'm not talking about it today. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about me because I did get the outreach award, and I wanted to discuss a little bit of why I really love to do outreach. Um, this is me, I was born in Karatha. I have a twin sister, um, so there was two of me. She's completely different. She's in the corporate role and earns way too much, more than I'd ever dream of. Yep. Um, we moved around a lot in WA and South Australia, and that's where I did my PhD, which has already been said. So I did my PhD at University of South Australia, and that's where I fell in love with nanotechnology. Um, it was after postdocing between the two universities, uh, Flinders and UniSA, that I decided to drag my family um, it's a funny story because my husband's uh, English and he hates cold weather. Um, so I had to drag him quite literally to Wellington. Luckily, there's good surf there. I did a, well, I was, had a five-year postdoc position and that's where I shortly after started a lecturer role and then came back to my family. Oh, well, sort of, because they're on the other side. But um, within the same continent. So I've been at the University of Newcastle for five years, so it's my longest job so far. Um, this is my research group. They're the ones who do their research. I just tell them ideas and come up with solutions, sometimes. Um, so I've got some past students. Garima basically incepted this project. She's the one that I worked with in Wellington and came up with this idea. Um, and now Zarina, she's got an amazing story. She uh, came from New Zealand to do a PhD with me, um, then got stranded back in New Zealand for COVID and has done a complete PhD there. I didn't tell the university, <laughs> keep that one quiet. But yes, yeah, so she did her entire PhD at Christchurch at a surrogate lab. Um, and that's what today's research is based on. So now we have Emma who's continuing that work. Um, and obviously a lot of other great researchers there too. Um, like I said, it's a multidisciplinary team. So we look at um, E. coli detection or pathogen detection, lung cancer detection using similar platforms. I use quantum dots, I love quantum dots. Um, which I'll discuss a little bit today. Uh, and also um, these guys here are Lee and Anish. They're looking at battery storage. So they're looking at micro emulsions for electrolytes. Very broad. <laughs> so lung cancer, we know that it's quite hard to detect. Um, and usually people don't go to the doctor until they have symptoms. Um, so that causes a late diagnosis and a pretty much poor outcome for um, patients. The only way to detect diagnosed cancer at the moment is a bronchoscopy uh, followed by a tissue biopsy. That's not going to change. I've spoken to doctors, that's going to be part of the process for as long as we, um, they know for now. But what I'm sort of postulating is a current, uh, like the screening process for lung cancer. So we know that screening processes work. We've got the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. It has 90% of cases which can be treated and detected early. <laughs> got breast, can uh, breast cancer screening, um, 74,000 deaths per 100,000 in 99, um, down to 40 deaths per 100,000 in 2014. And in fact, Kathy, a student, is looking at a spectroscopy project to look at an earlier ca uh, cancer detection, for a uh, nicer cancer diagnosis process rather than mam mammography. Um, but again, I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, so we've got national cervical cancer as well. 85% uh, of precancers can be treated within six months. So that's where I'm coming in from looking at a breath angle. So each of you have excelled about 20 litres of breath since I've started talking, much more since everyone else started talking. Um, and in fact, it's about 7,000 litres a day. And it was um, Garima who was looking at these things called extracellular vesicles in Wellington, um, and they're nanoparticles, so that's why I was interested in them. I'm a physicist, I like to squish them, I like to count them, I like to see how many are there. 
Uh, and they're great because they're acting as biomarkers these days. So biologists look at them because they have cancer proteins. I like to look at the proteins on the surface of those and I like to target them. Um, so she was reading a manuscript and it had proteins there and she said, oh look, there's some proteins there that tell us that there might be some of these nature's own nanoparticles in breath. And I said, okay. So I went into a freezer, quite literally, <laughs> breathed into a tube, collected a sample, and we did some analysis and we found these nanoparticles. So that's the story. So that's what I'm thinking. Thinking, well, we have roadside alcohol testing on the roads. I want to make that accessible to uh, something like lung cancer. Very blue sky, but that's how we do research, right? We aim for big. So these are what they look like. There's Grima. Um, so we have a living cell, almost every single cell, and this is what amazes me about biology, almost every living cell will release these nanoparticles um, and we call them extracellular vesicles. Once upon a time they were called exosomes, now they're not. <laughs> so it changes fluidly. Um, but they range about, um, the ones that we're interested in, about 50 to maybe 200 nanometers. Um, and so they have this lipid membrane and they have these proteins in the membrane and they have a lot of other stuff in there, RNA, DNA, other proteins, but we're interested in what's on the surface that we can access. Um, so oh, I said almost all living cells release them, so we know that cancer cells do, we know that healthy cells do, so they almost are a mini-me from the cell they came from, and so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at seeing if we can get these from um, a saliva or from breath, and to see if we can tell what cell they came from and whether that cell was diseased or not. We also look at some from E. coli cells. And for a moment there, I did look at plants as well. Um, but let's get back to the story. I go on tangents, my students love it. Um, so we have these pictures here. I have little spears. That's what they look like in, uh, when we look at them. So I have many nice techniques that I like to use, one being electron microscopy, the other one being atomic force microscopy. I like atomic force microscopy because it was the same year I was born that it was developed. Silly things, right? Um, but yeah, so with the electron microscope, we look at electrons either hitting and rebounding, that's the top one, scanning electron microscopy, or we look at transmission where they go through the sample. And so these ones show the spheres that they look like directly from my breath, um, little nanoparticles, and then the electron microscopy gets a, high, a higher um, magnification, and you can see the higher dense region, this is where all the electrons are, um, that's giving us um, an extracellular vesicle, and it's about 100 nanometers. Um, yeah, so we're looking at capturing these on a gold surface, and that's our electrode for an electrical response. So I'm gonna go through that in the next part. I, I do that using aptimate technology. We use DNA aptimers, we have RNA aptimers too, but I don't use those yet. Um, at the moment, we use short strands of DNA that specifically target one of these proteins. I'm going to say this one is a CD63 protein, and that tells that's prominent on all of these extracellular vesicles. That's where we started as a proof of concept. We just wanted to see if we could capture them directly from breath. Um, so if we have a look at, uh, I didn't know what sort of audience we had. I knew it was going to be broad, so I just wanted to touch on what size scale we're considering, and also that way I can show you some of my quantum dots that I make. <laughs> but we're looking at the one billionth of a metre range. So the quantum dots, for example, uh, they range from about three to six or eight nanometers. Um, and just changing their size will give us a different fluorescence. So you would have heard of the QLED TVs. They have the exact quantum dots that I make in my lab, <coughs> except for my quantum dots are for my biomedical applications. So I can put these targeting ligands on those and I can target something specific like an E. coli cell or an E. coli extracellular vesicle. Um, yeah, so, and it's all about to do with the physics of those. So the size gives us a band gap, we can excite it, um, and the size then relates to um, an emission that relates to the size of that energy band gap. All right, so this is the device that Zarina, who got stranded in New Zealand, made. So all uh, in the luxury of a surrogate lab, uh, um, Volker's lab, which was very nice to have. So she 3D, uh, sorry, she used photolithography, and this is a sample circle here. So we've got four different spots here that we can use. And so what she did, she spent four years of her research 
optimizing the attachment of the aptma which targets the extracellular vesicles. So she started with the target of the CD63, which is on all of them, and then she looked at CD44, which is a lung cancer biomarker or present for most lung cancer cells. Um, and in fact, she was able to show that it works for both. So not only did we establish a nice method to produce an optimal layer of these targeting ligands onto a gold surface, but then she could apply it to two different targets on the extracellular vesicles. Um, and so she used this term called electrochemical impedance spectroscopy uh, to measure that. And so what we'd see is we've got these they look like DNA strands, because they are, um, but they specifically target either CD63 or if another substrate could target CD44. Um, and once you uh, scan that with electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, we get this semicircle. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to go into the depth of that because that would be an hour lecture. And I've already done that at 12 noon today and then jumped on a train to get here. So, <laughs> and thank you for being more captivating than those students. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that just relates to the resistance of the layer. So we expect it, a gold surface to have low resistance because it's a nice conductor. Then we add a layer and it has a higher resistance. And that's what we get. So it forms a resistive layer and we get a response. And that response is actually related to the concentration of these nanoparticles that we captured from breath. Now this was a great start, it was the first prototype um, and these are just some of the results that we're producing in this journal article at the moment, she submitted two, two weeks ago. Um, so we have the optimization, so how long it took to form a nice layer and in fact it forms a nice layer and at six hours and then it goes to crap. <laughs> no, it doesn't go to crap. It, it allows more electron flow through. We wanted, we wanted um, a nice semicircle, the largest we could, so that way we get a better, better response and we can measure that. And we can see that we've got the CD44 and we use this aptima called Aptectex. I'm pretty sure that's just because it's an author's name. Um, and so that targets CD44. We just started with the protein. We wanted to make sure it worked for the protein first and then we got some lung cancer extracellular vesicles and we started there. And we did all the, back, uh, the background controls as well. So it was great, it worked, but now we want to make it better. And there we go. And this is where my good friends Craig Priest and Ben from the University of South Australia, yes that's where I did my, uh, my PhD, so I have known them for a while, um, so we're upgrading. It doesn't look like much, but you can see the gold, this is one sample here. But what they're able to do is to make these little micro pillars. So the scale there, if we, I like to walk around, it's very restrictive right this. Um, but this little green bar here is about two microns. And in fact, they're about 10 microns high. And those little stripes in the background, they, that's our gold electrode. So they're indigitated, uh, indigitated? Yeah, I can't say that word, but it's called an IDE. That's what I've got here. Um, so it's a gold pillared IDE. And so not only does it allow these extracellular vesicles to bind to the surface, but it stops other larger stuff from coming in and affecting it. And it's, so it's a really cool technology that we're working with and it's a very good way to improve our device even further. And in fact, it only needs nanoliters of solution. So it's um, got this wicking um, uh, thing to it, so it, all the uh, solution gets sucked into those pillars quite nicely. So this is just some of the work that we've done where they've looked at the bare IDE. So this is without the pillars. And you can see that the normalised current density, so that's just meaning what current goes to the electrode, decreases. So it goes down to 20%. And we postulate it's because the larger tumor spheroids that we have put in the solution are blocking anything from happening. When you compare that to the pillared IDEs, we get quite a constant 100% uh, transfer of the electrons. Um, so it means that it's definitely anti-fouling is what we've sort of come to it. So that's what we're doing. We're getting our breast samples. And in fact, um, that was part of Zarina's project, but uh, she had an ethics approval. But then, <laughs> what do you know, we couldn't do it. So now Emma's taken over that ethics and she's currently in the process of collecting 50 patient breaths, just of healthy patients. We want to get a good uh, uh, sample and establish a method first. Um, and so we're going to use these little gold electrodes with the micropillars. We're going to attach the aptimers, which she's successfully done. And she's even done the preliminary work where she's attached the EVs on there as well, or the extracellular vesicles. And we've been getting some nice responses there, which is really good because they're um, a little bit 
um, fragile, so we wanted to make sure they worked well, those nano, the micro pillars. Um, so I wanted to cover some other applications. I mentioned, I mentioned the viral detection, so that's with Professor Nathan Bartlett. So he's done a lot of work in virology, and so he provided these slides for me and then interpreted them for me so I could interpret them to everyone else. But um, he's got this uh, culture of um, cells, epithelial cells, and they relate to the air track cells, so they're very similar. And so what we're postulating is that if we infect those cells with a virus such as COVID, which he's got a lot of experience in, and then try and look at the EVs that those cells release, we'll have an indirect method to monitor viral detection. One that we can do from breath, just like I did with the lung cancer, what like we're doing with the lung cancer. And so we don't even know if these cells do release extracellular vesicles until about a month ago when we got this image. So we're able to uh, wash the cells surface uh, with PBS, just a buffer, uh, collect it, isolate it, and then put it onto our electron microscope um, to see these nice nanoparticles. And you can even, this one, you can see the nice lipid bilayer here, about seven nanometers as expected. Um, there's a lot of fluorescent microscopy here. Um, I think it just relates to how the cells look here. So we've got the, uh, the tubulin here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm glad Nathan's not here, but he would be able to tell you what they are. But, and they've got mucosa, I remember the mucosa in red, but it definitely reflects the cells um, that are just in your breath tract there, the airway. Um, the other project is in collaboration. I have lots of collaborator, collaborations because I'm a physicist and they are experts. Um, Carl Hassan, he looks at microbiology. And so we've got two different projects on this where we look at targeting E. coli cells and then targeting extracellular vesicles that are derived from these cells. And we can use that as another mode of detection because one cell is a lot harder to capture than multiple nanoparticles that are, that are quite easy to capture. And so that's what my student's been doing, and she's been using <coughs> quantum dots. So we've got indium phosphide, zinc sulfide quantum dots with the targeting Aptima specifically to E. coli, and we've been using that to look at the extracellular vesicles that way. Something else I thought was fun, because I like to manipulate these as much as I can. Like I said, I like to squish them. I also like to make them explode, and I also like to make pores in the membrane. So that's what we did here. We actually put an electric field on these extracellular vesicles derived from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, another bacteria. Um, and <coughs> what we were able to do, if we had nanoparticles, such as gold nanoparticles that were less than 10 nanometers, and then put those in the solution with the extracellular vesicles, and then zap them, the pores would be big enough for those nanoparticles to go inside. And that's what we see here. So we've got a 50 nanometer um, extracellular vesicles and about five to seven nanometer gold nanoparticles. Um, and in fact, gold nanoparticles, if you ever want to do outreach, is one of the most easiest nanoparticles to make. I do those for outreach on a regular basis. So let me know if you want me to give you a nice recipe for students. Um, but yeah, so you just use a citrate, um, that stabilise them, stabilises them. Um, and in this one, we actually used an thioaptima for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which was another application um, back in Wellington. We also did the same with our quantum dots. So we've got our indium phosphide zinc sulphide quantum dots. These ones were red fluorescent, so about five nanometers. Um, and we put our aptimas on the surface in a similar way, using something we like to call click chemistry. Um, and we loaded them inside our extra, um, extracellular vesicles using a similar way. And we had to optimise it. Obviously, if you increase the electric field enough, you're going to make them explode. If you don't, then they just return, um, just do nothing. So I'm on time, which is good. I have to acknowledge the students. They're the ones who've done all the work here. Um, and yeah, the group is growing. Zarina's just submitted a PhD thesis. And in fact, I forgot to add Harleen to the mix as well. So apologies to her. She started earlier this year. Um, and the collaborators, so we've got Carl Hassan, who's a microbiologist, Nathan Bartlett, who's a virologist, Craig Priest, who runs the AMP node at um, UniSA and does all the machining, all the engineering. They have 3D printers, a whole entire room of them. It's amazing. And his postdoc, Bing Guan, and Vulcan Nock from the University of Canterbury, who allowed Zarina to complete her PhD. Um, thank you again. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the Q&A.